So I can start now. Okay. So last time I so I showed that uh, so how to define define an index for general situation for the general situation that uh, so actually index is defined for a conditional expectation. So then the natural question is that uh, so is there not is there a canonical condition of expectation for a given subalgebra? And in a good situation, actually there is. Well, one situation is that in the case of two and factors, then there is a first preserving conditional expectation. But for for say general factor case, say, then there is an another choice. It's uh, so called the minimal minimal conditional expectations. I'll talk about. That. So uh, the street, so so we are in this situation. We have a well, either factor or a sister algebra, and with a conditional expectation, and we assume the existence of a basis. Right, and assume. <coughs> so the well. The index for E uh, is defined as a central element of A, but uh, to minimize any indices, then uh, you, ne you need a scalar. So let's assume this condition. Equals the complex numbers. So A and B can be a factor, or just a simple A and B are unitary simple systems. In either case, the argument works. Right. Then in this situation, uh, notice that uh, okay, relative commutant of B in A is finite dimensional automatically in this situation. So I think there are many many proofs of that. But one is that uh, so you think of E, okay. As a map from the relative commutant, okay. so you consider the restriction of E to the relative commutant. Then this is a map from the relative commutant to the center of E. And by assumption, it's uh, the complex number. So this, this gives you a state. So on one hand, this gives you a state of the relative commutant. But on the other hand, you have a Pimistar Popper inequality. For any A, for any positive element in the relative commutant. So okay, these two condition forces that uh, automatically so the relative commutant is a finite dimension. So it's a, it's a good exercise right? for the students who just started, uh, uh, started learning uh, operator algebra. So once it, you, okay, if this is an infinite dimensional sister algebra and phi uh, is a state, then okay, this doesn't hold. You can find the uh, well. Say you can find a normal one element, normal one positive element, and uh, well, you can make uh, this value very small. So, so this for this condition forces that uh, the relative commutant is finite dimensional. That's one proof. Right. So, and. Uh, I've, so in this situation, I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, there is a. Oh yes, but but uh, well, this is a phase. Yeah, yeah. Since well, because of this Pimisen uh, Fortin inequality. So. Right. So I, I'll show you that uh, there is a unique conditional ex expectation. Once you assume that, so this pair has. A, Conditional expectation of wind 
with the basis then I show you that there is a unique conditional expectation which minimizes the possible value of the index. And the key lemma is a kind of Radon Nicodem. So, uh, so if we say that for any map from A to B, which is a BB bimodule map, then there exists a unique element. So it's kind of Radon Nicodem derivative in the relative comedy. So it's unique. Satisfying this condition, so M H X say A. Oh sorry. F A is given by E H A. So it's an easy consequence of the equidistance of the basis here. So let me give you the proof. So from the basis, from the definition of the basis, there must there exists such an element A, and it should be of this form. So you just look at this here. Then you see that if there is such an H, then it should be of this form. You are star. So, so this, so at least, first this shows that the uniqueness. So, to show the existence, let's define H by this formula. Uh, then the first uh, switch checks that H is in the relative committance, so let's compute this. So B is in the capital B, and let's compute this. So, so uh, I, I'm I have been using this trick for many times, but now we expand this part by using the basis. Uh, which way? Yes, uh, this way. B and J. And the star. Then the, the switch, is switch I see it's the order of the summation here. And uh, since uh, F is a right B module map, so I can put this into F. Then the use using the basis property of UI, then I get that. Ah, yes, B, J, is a star. Since F is a left, B module map, so you get stuff. So certainly, so you see that H is in the relative commutant. And in a similar computation, so, so we, now we have to check this, but it's easy. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, yeah, this is the definition of H. You write star A. Right. So this is a, since A is a left B module map, UI, UI star A. Now, so this is, again, I use the fact that uh, F is a right B module map. Get a uh, A. So this is F A. So we're done. So it's a really easy, easy lemma, but it's very useful. Right. So as a consequence of this lemma, so we immediately have the following two statements. The first one is that uh, so any BB by module map is actually determined its risk by its restriction to the relative commit. So if F1 and F2 are BB by module maps, 
from A to B. What? Oh, uniqueness. So if there is such an H, then by, you know, by using the basis property, then it must be of this one. So it's unique. You put UI here, UI star here, then take some H. Then H must be of this form. If there's a finite basis, then H has to be faithful. Yeah, yeah, that's also, yes. Yes, that's what argument also works. Yes. E is a faithful expectation. Right. So let's, let me continue the statement. Uh, so if F1 and F2 are BB by module maps, and if uh, they coincide on the relative commuter, then they must be the same. This is one corollary, and another one is if the restriction of E to the relative commutant is, uh, is a trace. Then, for any H in the relative commutant, and for any A in the capital A, so we have this. So H A, E H A equals to E A H. This is an easy consequence. These are easy consequences of the event. So why? Well, it's uh, okay. So let's okay, let's consider. Let's take the rather negative derivative for e, f one and f two. So it's uh, okay. Take this h i in the relative commutant such that uh, so fi a is uh, ehi a so if so they coincide on the relative commutant then it means that uh, for for any a in the relative commutant of B in A, we have this equation. So, so as you told, so E is a faithful conditional expectation. So this implies that uh, H1, H. So this implies that this is that. Well, you just put A to the H1 star and H2. Then you get this equation. It means that F1 equals F2. And the second statement, uh, well, yes. So if H is a, OK, if H is an element in the relative commutant, then you can define two BB by, by boundary maps, so F1. Let's define F1 by this, say this way and a f2 a by e a h then then uh, since the restriction assumption is that the restriction of e to the relative commutant is a trace so it's so then if you define f1 and f2 this way then uh, you see that they coincide on the relative commutant of course. Um, so first of all, so since H is in the relative commutant, so this F1 and F2 are BB by module maps. And they coincide on the relative commutant. So by the first statement, they should coincide. So So last time I said that I didn't do any Tomita-Takisek theory, but well, here I'm implicitly doing the relative, well, the modular theory of the conditional expectation. 
So this is a, there's a notion of a relative modular automorphism group for a conditional expectation. So this says that if the restriction of E to the relative commutant is a trace, then relative modular automorphism is trivial. That's what really it says. But you don't really need to understand the modular theory at all. It's a really simple fact. So uh, there is another lemma which is necessary to show the existence of uh, minimal conditional expectations. That uh, that uh, well, it's kind of also it is also a kind of a dual operator valued weight defined in an algebraic way. So for for x is a relative commutant. So we define the following map. Then, well, in exactly in the same way I show that uh, index is in the central element, you can show that this belongs to the center way. And by assumption, it's, uh, it's a scalar now. So, these things are also independent of the basis UI or? Ah, yeah, right, right, yes. So, as I, as, as I show that the index is independent of the basis, and this is independent of the basis, of course. Thank you very much. So this really depends on only E, not the basis. So this, this gives you a positive linear function, okay, on the relative commutant. Right, and this plays a very important role for the existence of the minimal index. After then you get index. So. Right, uh, so, so uh, let me state the restriction of E to the relative commutant is a trace. And then, uh, then this map, it's not really normalized, but it's trace, trace are functional, uh, and it is a faithful. Faithful trace. So this is also very easy, so I'm, I'll prove it. So what kind of things must be here? What? Wait, there's still. Yeah, yeah, center. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. So, about the trace. Yeah, okay. So it's easy to see. Okay, if V is a unitary in the relative commutant. Then, well, so of course you are by definition UIs, they form a basis of E, but uh, it's easy to show that this is also a basis. And uh, for that I use uh, the property here. Yeah using this property. Using this property, then, uh, well, here I assume that the, relative co uh, the restriction of E to the relative commutant is a trace. So you can use this property, and using that, then it's easy to see that this is also, also a basis. So this means that uh, you c well, and, uh, well, since this is independent of the choice of the basis, then uh, you see, you have this one. So you get this.
you get an unitary invariance of this linear function. So it means that it is a trace. So this implies that this is a trace. Now I have to show that it's a trace, but this, we already know that this is a trace. Well, it doesn't matter. But anyway, so since uh, the relative commutant is finite dimensional, so if there is something, something in the kernel, and if there is a positive element, non-trivial positive element in the kernel, then you can show that there is a projection in the kernel. So assume. Uh, P is a projection. Which in, is in the kernel. Then uh, by the definition of this map, so this means that uh, so UI P is a right. Now I use the basis property of UI. So, so if P should be expressed as uh, UI star P. This is the definition of the basis. But uh, since P is in the relative commutant and the restriction we to the relative commutant is trace, so I can move. P from from right to left, but uh, since this is zero, so this is must be zero. So P is zero, and uh, H E is a faithful linear function. Okay. Right. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that uh, so my presentation last time heavily relies on the uh, Watatani's monograph. So he published about, uh, I think, in 90, he published a monograph of uh, index of, uh, for sister algebras. So my presentation last time re re relies on his monograph. And uh, so, oh, OK. The argument I'm presenting is essentially due to HIAI. Here is a paper uh, modified by Watatani. Right, so now let's consider H. It's a positive element and inverted. Satisfying this condition. So consider such an element H. Then you can define another conditional expectation by this formula. So this is clearly a positive BB by module map, but because of this condition, it's, con it's unitary. So it is, it is a conditional expectation. And actually, you can easily see that. Ah, uh, which way? Yes, minus. This is the basis for this new conditional expectation. So the index of f, this new conditional expectation, f is given by, ah, uh, it's, uh, yes, ui, h inverse ui, by the definition. And this is nothing but, uh, H E uh, like minus half. Mi minus. Half. Minus half. Yes. Yeah, you put uh, yes star of this thing here, then the H H E half and H minus half cancel. Yes, this is right. So now our problem is the following. Problem. So minimize. So this is the index. So you fix 
one conditional expectation E. That's a reference point. Then what you want to do is that you want to minimize minimize this quantity. Under the condition, under this condition. So this is really a really simple question. And uh, moreover, so even you, if you start with a conditional expectation <laughs> whose restriction is not a trace, by this trick, you can produce a conditional expectation whose restriction is a trace. So as a reference point, you can choose a conditional expectation whose restriction is a trace. So you may assume the restriction of the E to the relative commutant is a trace. So this is really a simple problem. So you have a finite dimensional C star algebra. So it's a just a direct sum of matrix algebra. So you have one trace here. Then if this is a trace, then this thing is also a trace. You have another trace. So you are given one, you are given finite dimensional C star algebra. And then you are given two traces, two faceful traces. Then you want to minimize this value under this condition. So it's a really easy application. Actually, you can solve this immediately by using a Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier method. So I don't really want to comp present that computation, computation, but that's a really easy application of a Lagrange multiplier method. But here I came up with a solution. The solution is the following. So there exists a unique, unique conditional expectation such that so it minimizes. So the index of E zero is less than or equal to any possible other conditional expectation. And moreover, the restriction is zero to the relative commutant is a trace. So this is the existence, and uh, he got a nice characterization. Namely, given E is this, OK, such a conditional expectation is called uh, the minimal conditional expectation. Yes? And uniqueness is subject to the second requirement, trace requirement also, or is this further true? Okay, uh, so uniqueness is just here, so uh, I should write, uh, say, moreover. Moreover here. So it's already unique up, up to here. And such a, such a expectation is always a trace on the relative commutator. And uh, there's a really nice characterization of such an expectation. OK. So, so given a uh, given expectation is a minimal expectation, if and only if there exists uh, some composite constant C such that this whole, the restriction E to, uh, yeah, let me write this way. So this trace is, uh, well, in general, this is a linear function, but anyway is uh, proportional to the restriction of E to the relative point. So this is a very easy, very useful characterization. And of course, this number, well, this number is always the uh, index value. And, uh, well, yes. If 
said that right at the beginning was God given. Oh, no, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is called uh, minimal conditional expectation. So, so I don't really want to you know, present the proof, but uh, well, given this setting, so especially so this is a trace, then uh, it's really easy to show that. It's just a, a well, you can you can uh, you can give this problem to uh, in a linear linear algebra class, and I think uh, well, probably half of the students can get a solution. <laughs> it's easy. I think here the main point is that uh, he he puts the problem in this form. Then it's easy to get a solution. Actually, so last week I attended a conference of of the uh, so here the retirement. So he he is 65 years old now and. Uh, so he's retiring now, in a few days. So we, we have a conference for that. And uh, he gave a speech. And when he got his, this result, he thought it was trivial. So he didn't want to publish it. But the course like, forced him to, to publish it. And it was the right thing to do. So, since we have this uh, really nice conditional expectation, so from now on, my definition is the following. So the index of D in A is always the index of uh, this particular conditional expectation. So at least this, co well, this notation coincides with the case of, uh, say, e e extremal external subfactor in the sub two bank setting. And uh, the Jones projection, so I use this notation for the minimal conditional expectation. And uh, why I use only, only minimal, conditional, uh, minimal conditional expectation from now. I use this notation. So if you do a basic construction with respect to the minimal one, is the dual one also minimal? Minimal, yes. The dual one is also minimal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Now the next topic is the uh, local index form. Your trivia. Then let's choose a projection in the relative cometer. Then there is a conditional expectation. So E is E0 in our situation now. So there is a natural conditional expectation from uh, this algebra to uh, given by this formula. So you need a normalization here. Uh, okay, then the natural question is what, the, what is the index of this conditional ex expectation or whether this is a minimal or not? That's a natural question. And uh, actually it's easy. Or that this is minimal and that uh, to give the right formula. Uh, okay. First, we need a base for this conditional expectation, and that's a, such a natural one. Uh, say one. So this is a basis for for this conditional expectation E P. 
Okay. And uh, this is again minimal. And in particular, the index is given by this formula. Ah. So I also suppress W sign here. It coincides with the probabilistic index in this situation. So, again, proof is just a straightforward computation. So let's. Uh, Let's consider, well, let's compute this. So x is in, the, in this corner. Then we want to compute this. Yes. Ah, I forgot something, yes. Then this is, uh, first of all, P is in the relative commutant of B. So we can move P from here to there. And uh, yes. And uh, by the normalization terms of these to disappear. Yes. And uh, well. Since the restriction of E to the relative commutant is a trace and the P is in the relative commutant, I can move this P from here to there. And this is a half X is in this algebra, so this is the X. Sorry? Oh, I didn't specify. It. Oh, P is a projection in the relative commutant. Non zero, say. Non zero projection in the relative commutant. Now, with the, uh, so this shows that uh, we get x, p, x. OK. So, so this gives you a uh, basis of this uh, EP. Now you want to compute. Well, you want to show that this is a, this is a minimal expectation. And, okay, I already erased it, but uh, there is a nice characterization of the minimality. So for that, I need to compute this. So um, x is in the relative commutant. So let's compute this. Then. Uh, P U I P X U I star P. It's supposed to be B F U. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. So <coughs> yes. Right. So this is uh, yes here you. Have UI US star, so this is uh, nothing about uh, this. H E, H E X, P. But uh, since H E is proportional to uh, E, so we get the uh, index of E here and uh, E P. X. So by the definition of EP, this is EP square. Ah, uh, EP square is e sub PX, right? 
So this, okay, this means that, uh, okay, HEP is proportional to the restriction of EP to the relative commutant. And the scalar term is this. So this implies that EP is minimal. And the index, this scalar term is index. So index of EP is EP square index times EP index of E. Right. So now we have this square term, controversial square term, actually. So this means that, uh, okay, if if P, are, P and Q are projection is a relative point. The projection is mutually orthogonal. Then, so this square term means that, uh, so index of E, E plus Q, okay, let's uh, take a square root. Then this is uh, E P plus Q times the square root of the index. And EP. Of course, this is plus EQ So it, we get this equation. So in other words, the square root of the minimal index is additive. Index itself is not additive, but this is additive. Right. And this fact is very important when you consider, well, actually this quantity corresponds to the categorical dimension in the fusion category language. That's why this is additive. Of course, if you start with, uh, say, finite depth subfactor, then uh, every trace preserving expectation is a minimal index. So you, and you take best construction, you get a minimal expectation. Finite depth. Oh, depth. So it's extreme. So then trace preserving expectation coincide with the minimal index. So everything is fine. So in other words, it's really tricky to deal with uh, no extreme support. Related to uh, the trace scaling term of the corresponding t two infinity subfactor, it has non trivial module, term, so to speak. Right. So this is a ro local index formula. And uh, another important fact is the multiplicativity of the minimal index. So we are in the same situation. So we, we have A and B whose center are trivial and uh, E is a minimal expectation. Then let's consider another algebra and uh, expectation here. So assume so they are, well, let's, let's assume they are, say, factors. And uh, E and F are minimal. The natural question is that the composition is minimal. But it's, well, it's a bit surprising, but uh, it took some time to show that this is really minimal. 
And the original proof was really, you know, it's involved. It's a, it, it, well, it's a mess. I think it's, of course I can long fast prove it, but it's kind of mess. But now we have a really easy proof of this by using the basis. I, it, I think it's due to uh, what the Tani and the car come. We have a really easy proof now. So in this situation, so let's assume that uh, UI is a basis for, for E and VJ is basis for F. Then, uh, which is the right order? Yes. So easy observation is that, of course, this is the base. Is the basis for for the composition. So E F. You know, this is a really easy observation. Now, what we want to show that, uh, okay. Now we want to show that, uh, so H of F E is proportional to the restriction of uh, uh, this composition to the relative commitment. Yeah. And for that, we need, we need this lemma, which is, which is uh, I, well, again, it's very easy. So for any element in the relative commitment of A, of C, relative, sorry, relative commutant of C in A. Uh, this is in the relative commutant of, well, which is, uh, yes, Vj, x Vj star. This is in the relative commutant of B in A. And this is, uh, again, very easy. It's the same kind of manipulation of basis. So I, I skip this, but uh, yeah, you can prove this in exactly the same way I, I did it several times before. So using this observation, then now easy to calculate the H F E. So let's calculate this for X in this relative comment, relative commutant of C in A. And this is a uh, UJ, UI, UJ, X, J, I. Maybe I should put uh, this summation here. Then, so that lemma says that this, this part belongs to the relative commutant of B. So, so here you get, what you get is this, HE. So otherwise you cannot define, but uh, since this part belongs to the relative commutant here, so you get, uh, HE. Right. Since we assume that the E is, a, is a, the minimal conditional expectation, so this, this is proportional to, to E. Right. Now, Vj belongs to B and E is of course a BB bimodule map, so you get uh, you get this. But now this element belongs to the reactive commutant of C in B. Right. So Then, uh, yes. Uh, is there something? Oh, yes, yes. We have this. Again, I assume that the F is a minimal, so it should be proportional to F in the relative commutant. So, F. 
and you get f x. So this shows that on the relative commutant of c in a, then this thing is proportional to the composition here. And if you get the uh, bj's coming out of the, the line that was going from there to the next one. Here? Yeah, from here to the next one. Oh, Bj. Bj is the basis of F, so Bj is an element of B. Element of, oh, it's an element of C. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, this composition satisfies the, here is the characterization. And it simultaneously gives multiplicity of minimal index. Now uh, it's time to talk about sectors. Uh, but so up to here, are there any questions, comments? So we have often run into this question of when there is a two-sided basis. Have you ever thought about that? Two-sided basis? Two-sided basis, yeah. Uh -huh. Works both ways. For, for bi-module? For, for sub Subfactor. Sub no. What do you have there? I'm trying to figure this out. Ah. Is it possible to? We have no counterexample. I think it's impossible if it's extremal, if it's not extremal. Uh -huh. We have no counterexample for the existence of a two sided basis in the extremal case. Yeah, I've never thought about it. And actually, uh, wow. Well, well, up to here, you know, my argument, well, I just started from, uh, from the beginning, I assumed the existence of a basis. Right. But actually, uh, probably tomorrow or, or in two times. <laughs> so I'll choose a particularly nice basis and they, they are isometries. Yeah. So it's, uh, but while they, how to say, uh, they give you a very cross product like expansion. And uh, they are very useful when you, especially when you calculate the angles between two subfactors. But they are isometric, so they, they are opposite, kind of opposite of two side basis, yeah. Right. This calculation? Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the picture for basis? They can do this planar algebra calculus. Yeah. In but you have to have a thick, thick line on the left. Mm -hmm. You're never allowed to go past it. Mm. The basis element will be certain. Um, actually, uh, yes. Um, so the, the basis, of what uh, the basis I talked about right now, are intertwined of some some morphisms. So they have a, a pictorial explanation. Yeah, yeah, expression. Right. So now I'll talk about sectors. So yesterday you briefly mentioned, Bon briefly mentioned that, uh, so principal graphs are obtained from, uh, well, in two ways. Uh, one way is to consider just a tower of relative commutant. The other, the other way is to consider bimodule and take tensor products, right? So, so I, I, I come back to that point. So let's start with the two one factors. Finite index. Well, 
Right. Then, uh, so Bon and also Zef also talked about uh, standard invariant. So let me recall that. So uh, M and M. So yesterday you learned that uh, this nested uh, system of uh, finite dimensional system algebras, fundamental algebras are really important. Actually, they carry, well, in a good situation, say in a amenable, amenable situation, then they carry the complete information of sub-factors. Ah, uh, the other way. So. So, and uh, Bone mainly talked about uh, how to get a principal graph from this sequence and that sequence. You get two graphs. And then you, you have a sequence of uh, finite dimensional algebras. Then you get a fun, uh, principal graph. So, but well, today I, I will emphasize the uh, bimodular side of this, this thing. So, first of all, so M. M is by, by thanks to the bicomputant theorem of Mare von Neumann. So M is nothing but the endomorphism sp space of M as a right M module. So this is nothing to do with uh, algebra endomorphism. So you just think of uh, M as a right M module, then you consider the left module, uh, then right module maps, then bicomputant theorem. So M is nothing but uh, this endomorphism space. So it means that this relatively commutant is just an endomorphism space of M as N M by module. So what you get here is uh, the endomorphism space of M as N M by module. And similarly, well, so let's go. But for some reason, so I, I prefer to use iota for M as an NM by modules. So it's a joint with M as an NM by modules. So here, the endomorphism space of iota bar appears. So, so if you know this space, that means that uh, it's like uh, you know re the representation theory of finite groups. So if you know this space, it gives you the, the irreducible decomposition of this bimodule. Right. So what's next here? M1. So M1. Well, in Bond's talk, by definition, this is the endomorphism space of M as a right N module, right? So this means that this relative commutant is endomorphism space of M as a N N bimodule. And uh, well, this is tautological, but let let me like this way. So this is a modular tensor product over M. Of course, M is the uh, same as a module to tensor product of two copies of M over M. So let me write this way. So this means that uh, so the next relative commutant here is uh, identified with the endomorphism space of iota bar tensor iota. So I suppress the symbol here. So what's the next one? Next one, M2. So in the same way, M2 is uh, the endomorphism space of uh, M1 as a M right M module. So the relative commutant is uh, yes. So this is identified with the endomorphism space of M1 as N M by module. But uh, last time I showed that M M1 is uh, 
this construction is nothing but the module tensor product over n of the two copies of m. So this shows that again using this tautological notation, then uh, again this is isomorphic. Well, it should be identified with this triple tensor product, and so on, so on. So here, what you get is uh, this. So uh, Bon already explained yesterday. So you get this inclusion. You the bar. You the bar tensor you the. And in a similar way, see, you get a yota. <coughs> and so on and so on. So this means that uh, once you know the category, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I cannot say that it, they form a cut, tensor category because it has a well, it has legs, four legs. Well, four kinds of combination of legs. But uh, well, basically, so this means that the standard invariants are given by uh, the tensor category structure of the bimodule arising from uh, these two basic bimodules. <coughs> so, yota and yota bar generate four kinds of bimodules. Say mm. Mn, Nn, and Nn bimodules. And since these spaces are finite dimensional, that means that, you know, okay, tensor product of yota and yota bar are decomposed into irreducibles. They are decomposed into irreducibles. So now you have four kinds of bimodules, irreducibles. So let's start with the MM bimodules. So you, here, in this level, you put every, all irreducible bimodules, MM bimodules. They could be infinite, but in a good situation, there are only finitely many irreducibles. So starting with the typical one, is the typical element is uh, identity bimodules, that is M as a MM bimodule. Okay, but uh, you get more bimodules, usually. Then there's a way to, way to produce an uh, MM bimodule. So it's a, uh, uh, well, uh, just tensoring uh, yota from right. Okay. So you get a yota. Then you can go back from MN bimodule. So you can get MN bimodule by tensoring uh, yota bar from right. Then you get something else, and so on and so on. You can repeat it. Yeah, for example, okay. Sometimes you can get this picture. That's what I'm Yeah. <laughs> And you can play the same game. So here you put uh, all irreducible by bimodule. Then here you put all irreducible and then bimodule. You can do the same game. So you start from the identity object here. So it's uh, n as n and bimodule. So to go here, what you do is uh, from n n, I think, uh, yes, you tensor yota, yota bar from left, okay? No, no, it should be yota. Yes, yeah, this is yota. So from here, you go here. Then from MN bimodule, you can get NN bimodule by tensoring yota bar. So this is over N, this is over N. So you get uh, and right, so sometimes you get such a picture. Right. So you get two kinds of graphs, and these two graphs are not necessarily the same. 
find the indexes less than four, then they all they are all the same. But uh, some, well, if you go if you go beyond index four, then you you can get two different graphs. And these graphs are called principal graphs. So you have two graphs. So I never remember which is the principal graph and which is the dual principal graph. <laughs> I never remember. So, so let's say you have two principal graphs. And these graphs are so-called the hard graph sub. Those are for, uh, for the hard graph sub factor. Of index uh, uh, five plus square root thirteen over two. Right. So this means that okay. So these these two graphs are really important ingredients for subfactor, but usually they don't decide. They do not reside the subfactor completely. Or in other words, they don't decide. Uh, Standard invariant completely, but the tensor, well, tensor category, category structure of these bimodules completely decide the, uh, the structure of the standard bimodule, uh, standard invariant. That means that subfactor is determined by, or in a good situation, the subfactor is completely determined by the tensor category structure. So that shows that uh, these bimodules are really important. But in type three situation, then you can do something else. So in type three situation, so when M and N are type three factors, now assume that X is an M N bimodule. I'll say M M or M N bimodule. So very strange factor about a type three factor, say with a separate prudial, is that there is only one representation, only one normal representation. Yeah, it's yes, it's, it's Hilbert. It's oh yeah. So, so due to the fact that there is on essentially only one representation of n, so you can identify this as an M, say, so the left M module structure is given by the standard left multiplication. So this is a completion of M in the GNS construction. You choose uh, your favorite faithful normal state, then you get the same representation. Now, so this is standard left multiplication. So this means that your right action, of course, commute with the le left action. So it means that your right action comes from a standard right action. Namely, this gives you that there, there exists row from n to n. Star homomorphism such that. So this bimodule is nothing but the standard bimodule with a twist by row. <coughs> So by this symbol, I mean, so there is a natural M, M bimodule structure of the standard Hilbert space of M. So by this symbol, I mean that the right N action is given, given by this homomorphism, okay? There is a natural right multiplication, not really natural multiplication, but right module structure of this Hilbert space. Well, more precisely, more precisely, the right the bimodule structure, bimodule is given by, but if you know Tomita tax theory, then it must be given by this. So this is the modular conjugation. So this means that every bimodule, every information of this bimodule is encoded in single homomorphism here. So you can actually use 
and homomorphisms instead of bimodules in type 3 situation. And you can develop a nice theory of a tensor categories or something like that with an attribution by using homomorphisms. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to do from now. So first of all, there are a lot of structures for bimodules, the category of bimodules. One is, of course, uh, well, in every category, you have objects and the home space. So in the category of bimodules, home space are clear. Yeah. So in this category, so let's consider home space first. So row one and row two are homomorphism from N to N. And uh, well, so I sometimes just write this way to, to describe this situation. I, I use this notation. Okay. So whenever I write this way, then the row one is a homomorphism from N to M. Okay. Then the right home space is the following. Using this identification, using this identification, the right homomorphism space, home space for uh, homomorphism of between type 3 factor is the following. So the set of operator in the target M satisfying this intertwining relation. So it turns out that this space is the right home space in this category. And uh, actually, so this, this intertwining space was introduced much before Kohn introduced the correspondences. It, it was already there in the algebraic quantum field theory. Yeah, robots. Yeah, yeah. Topica has robots. So this is our home space. So then, uh, once you get a simple calculation, that this is the same thing as the home space between the bimodules. Yeah. Actually, well, uh, in this case, it's uh, say I should. Antinia, there is an antilinear isomorphism in this situation. So you can do both. So actually, there, there are two ways. Instead of considering this, uh, you can also consider this. Row bar. Then in the, well, if you identify this bimodule and the row, then you get a linear. In this case, antilinear. But Essentially, you get essentially the same space. Right. So once you get a homomorphism, then you, you have a definition of equivalence and uh, equivalence and irreducibility. So we say that row and row two are equivalent. If they exist a unitary. So this is the so-called C-star category. So it has a unitary structure. There exists a unitary in the homo space. And we say that the row is irreducible. If the home space, self home space is, let's say, end of space is trivial. But uh, if you look at this definition, then this is nothing but a relative commutant. So row being irreducible means that the image is an irreducible subfactor. Right, this is a home space. So what next? Ah, yeah. But uh, well, this is a very nice sister category, and uh, especially when if row i is irreducible. Then this is 
this home space is naturally a Hilbert space. By the following inner product. So if V1 and V2 are in this home space, then this product, this belongs to the self intertwined space of row 1, and uh, by definition, this is a convex number, so you get a scalar here. So you can introduce an inner product by this formula. So it's a Hilbert space, naturally. So the category of bimodules have more structure. So it has a direct sum. And in this category of homomorphisms, then the direct sum is defined up to equivalence. This is defined only up to equivalence, namely by this formula. So for yeah, S1 and S2 are isometries in the target. Satisfying these relations, the Kuntz algebra of two relation. So to to make a direct uh, direct sum, then you choose such such an isometry. You can choose them because uh, M is a type three factor. Then you then this formula makes a new homomorphism, and uh, well this does okay the the equivalence class of this direct sum doesn't depend on the choice of the isometries here. So this, this is the direct sum in this category. And of course, the most important thing is the tensor product. And I think this part is, is the advantage of the using a homomorphism instead of bimodule. Namely, so if you are given, say, homomorphism from N to M and uh, homomorphism from P to N, then you, you need an operation corresponding to the tensor product over N. But that's obvious, right? So there is only natural operation. So that's a composition. The composition given gives a homomorphism from P to M. So this corresponds to the tensor product in this category. Right. And what else? Yes, so in this category, so there is a nice dimension function. Memory. Uh, okay. For rho, let's define the dimension of rho by the square root of the index of the image of n. Okay. Then it turns out that uh, this this quantity is additive and uh, direct sum. And this essentially follows from a local index formula. This is just an interpretation of the local index formula. And this also, this function behaves well under uh, tensor product, composition. So it's a multiplicative. And this also follows from the multiplic multiplicativity of the minimum, ind minimum indices. So you need a basic. We have a minimal 
Yes. So now we are in. Oh, okay. Of course, um. Of course, I now I'm a bit cheating because well. What? Well, well. So let's assume everything is finite. Then it's already assumed that the image have the image has a finite index. It means by definition there is a basis. Type three case. Now everything is a factor. Yeah. <coughs> right. So. So that's why I I want to stick to the local well the minimal conditional expectation because then you you can define nice dimension functions. So so I use this notation. Sometimes, okay, the equivalence class of such a such homomorphism called is called a sector, and uh, so I use this notation for the set of homomorphisms from say unitary homomorphisms from n to m divided by equivalence relation. So if you were in the type two. Could you not do exactly the same thing by having sectors from homomorphisms uh, from n to the matrices on that? Oh, yeah, you can. Then you can do similar thing. Yeah, but every time you you need to go to the matrices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as foreign density composition, you have to have to pay a yeah. Yeah, composition it's a bit complicated, yes. Right. And the state you depend on given it's finitely? Um in general. In general you can define it, but uh, of course it's uh, good of Yeah, yeah, the, the subset of uh, finite index homomorphisms are mostly important. So I think it's time. That's the feeling.